This Week in Startups is brought to you by Rippling, the world's first way for businesses to manage their HR and IT in one system. For an easier way to onboard and supercharge new employees, go to rippling.com slash twist and get 20% off. Calm, seize the day and sleep the night with the help of Calm, the number one app for sleep. This Week in Startups listeners get 25% off a Calm premium subscription at calm.com slash twist. And Monday.com. Monday.com not only helps teams manage work and meet deadlines, but also builds a culture of transparency to work better together. Start your 14-day free trial by going to Monday.com slash twist. Then use promo code twist to get 10% off a paid account. Upcoming launch events. Apply for the next Launch Accelerator cohort. Applications are due September 2nd. Learn more and apply at launchaccelerator.co. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Startups. I'm your host, Jason Calacanis. We do this podcast twice a week. We've done that for 10 years. We're going to hit 1,000 episodes this year. So we've been at it for a while, and I've been wanting to have our next guest on for a couple of years. He's um, super famous and been super busy over the last decade solving for water. Um, He was a club promoter, degenerate, had a horrible uh, conscience... uh, what do they call that when you have a uh, crisis of conscience? Yeah, your conscience is seared. Yeah, and uh, he was having a great time in New York being a club promoter at places like Lotus and uh, fabulously um, got a f- bouncer fired at my old haunt, Bungalow 8, and then went on the lamb. And while he was on the lamb, he decided he wanted to do something important with his life after 12 years of just debauchery. That man is Scott Harrison. You know, his charity, Charity Water. You may or may not have read his best-selling book, Thirst. If you haven't, drop everything and get the audio book because you read it, right? I do, yeah. Yeah, and so I read it. I listened to it. I went for a couple of walks here. I'm in Santa Monica. It's such a great book. Thanks, man. Just author means a to lot author. To me. Like, it's really well done. Your story is told in a fearless and very honest way. And there were two moments I got choked up during you reading the book. Um and one of those moments was, I guess, when I first became aware of what you were doing, which was the birthday yeah. concept for yeah. Charity Water. I think everybody knows what Charity Water is, but just here at the onset, maybe for people who don't, explain what Charity Water is. And then maybe that first device you came up with, which worked really well, the birthday wells. Yeah. Um, we are on a mission to make sure every single human being on earth has clean water to drink. Uh, we're about 660 million people away from success. So- Currently, as we're sitting here in Santa Monica, one out of every 10 human beings on the planet is drinking bad water, unsafe water, uh, brown, viscous, scummy water, diseased water. And uh, we think that number should be zero. So we've been at this for 12 years now. And that's the mission. So we've accomplished our mission when everybody has clean and safe drinking water on the planet, regardless of where they're born. Uh, The vision is actually a little more it's even bigger than that. It's to reimagine or reinvent charity and to involve more people uh, in acts of generosity, in, in looking out for their neighbors in need around the world. And when I started, you know, I had the, uh, I guess, the advantage of being 30, not knowing anything about institutional philanthropy, uh, again, being a club promoter for 10 years, and I was living on a closet floor in New York City. So it wasn't, uh, you know, I had no money, I had no place to live, but I realized that most people didn't trust charities. They didn't trust these big institutional charities. And people wanted to help. They would look at the suffering in the world. They would see those TV commercials. They'd read the headlines and say, wow, people are suffering. What can I do? But they didn't trust the system. Why do you think people didn't trust the system? I think uh, for good reason. Uh, there, we all could probably name five or 10 scandals of, of charities who have done wrong, you know, squandered money, uh, nepotism, you know, overpaid. Oh, yeah, there was the guy... Uh from See, everybody has this, by the way. Everybody the has this. Oh, the there Fugees was the guy. or something. Uh, Probably Will y- I Am had a Haiti one. I think it was Wyclef. Oh, it was Wyclef. Was it Wyclef? Wyclef Sean. And he would Wait, pay what himself. What band is he from? Uh, he was from? he was a Fugees? performer. 
Okay, Fuji's. But he would. Uh, there was a, there was a scandal once where he was paying himself hundreds of thousands of dollars to perform at his own charity benefits. Oh my lord, Why, Clef? So he's the founder doing? of the charity. So, so, it wasn't so I, I do. Am. I apologize. But I, <laughs> you know, I, I do an annual gala, Why? right? Yeah. And I, you know, we're we're going to try and raise seven million dollars in San Francisco yeah. again this year. Yeah. That would be like me paying myself seven hundred thousand dollars to speak at my gala. Wow. To fundraise. Yeah. So that was a big scandal. I mean, yeah. everybody kind of has. Uh, a couple that they can pull out of their back pocket yeah. during a disaster relief or so uh, you know smarmy. Anderson Cooper used to do these specials where he would chase this, the charity CEO to the McMansion steps the door would slam in his oh face oh my lord yeah and you know people would throw up their hands and say that's why I don't give so I I, I came across this distrust as a I, the term social entrepreneur didn't even exist back then yeah. but as just a guy trying to bring clean water to the world by all means possible. Yeah. And I, re- I learned that 42% of Americans pulled by USA Today say they don't trust charities. Yeah. And 70% of Americans pulled by NYU say we believe charities waste our money. Of course. So yeah. you talk about a market opportunity. And you did something very unique. I think I remember. This is getting to the birthdays, by yeah. the way, in a very no, roundabout way. No, I know. Way, but, but I remember mm-hmm. when Chris Saka was on my podcast and then at our events, I think I've bought something around swearing. You we a couple, had a swear you jar. A I, I've bought in about three. Well, I think the wells were five k each, and I think I bought three of them so far. Okay, so we should look them up afterwards. And, exactly, and, and I know I paid for these because he was like, "Let's just do the swear jar," and he just let out twenty swears. But look, you haven't cursed once being with me. Look I know. I'm trying to listen. You guys are. <laughs> I'm going broke paying for wells. But I thought that was very interesting. You said, "Hey, the well costs five thousand mm-hmm. dollars." And uh, we're not taking any of people. that. Yep, one hundred percent. So the yeah. way we tried to solve for that charity distrust, I just I learned that the biggest problem people had with charities was not knowing where their money would go. Right? You you yeah. have means, you're willing to give and be generous, but you just want to know that your money is actually going to make an impact. Yes. So we said, let's take the most common objection that people have off the table and could we find a way to promise 100%. Mm. So, hey Jason, when you swear too much and you have yeah. to write a $15,000 check, yep. could we promise you that $15,000 yeah. would go directly into three communities? Right. So to do that, we had to open up a separate bank account for the overhead. Right. Because we have a necessary overhead. We have staff, there are flights, there's an office. Yeah. To manage that $15,000 well, yeah. we now have a team of 100 people that are doing that for other people who might be swearing around the world and having yeah. to pay. So the idea was two separately audited bank accounts and this public promise that 100% of the money would go. And then the second thing was just using technology to prove where the money went. Mm. And at the very beginning, we started the same around the same time as Google Earth and Google Maps. So I realized that Google had just created a free place where we could geolocate every Jason Calacanis well, right. right, of the three. So afterwards, we can go and pull, pump wow. your name into the system, and we're going to go find satellite images of the three wells you built 10 years so ago. So you just thread the needle there. Everybody knows, here's your well, that's And it. you could go yourself. You could turn up if they're in Kenya with a GPS Amazing. device for 50 bucks that you bought from Best Buy and turn up on your own family wells, maybe in the name of a loved one or But paradoxically, kids. this insight you had almost led to the death of the company. Multiple times. It did, it did. But let's go to the birthday. So yeah. we had this powerful issue, water, right? Everybody yeah. can stand for clean water, whether you are you know, a Democrat or a Republican or an independent or whether you're religious or you're not religious. Everybody can say human beings need clean drinking water. Yeah, it's kind of table stakes. It's basic. Right? Yeah. We can agree basic, to agree Universal on basic income, we could debate. There are, right. Clean uh, water. Even education. Mm, you know, if we're building easy. schools, you yeah. might say, oh, well, is there an ideology? Right. You know, are the teachers any good? What about the quality of the students and what the What are you learning? teaching them? Water is binary. Yeah. Clean or dirty. Yeah. You can test it. You can know that it's happening. So we had this powerful issue. Uh, and then we had this powerful 100% model. And then we stumbled upon this idea of asking people to donate their birthdays for clean water yeah. using the 100% model. And we said, look, we have birthdays. They've become so materialistic. We, yeah. we throw ourselves parties. We get gifts that we don't want or need. And I thought the sticky marketing idea would be that everyone, no matter how old they were, would ask for their age in dollars. Perfect. So a seven-year-old would say, hey, could you please donate $7 for my seventh birthday? Or an 89-year-old would ask for $89 for their 89th Perfect. birthday. And I wasn't sure that this was going to work, but I did it for my 32nd birthday when I launched Charity Water. 
And to my surprise, people started giving $32, $32, $32. And it just spread. Complete strangers were giving $32. So, you know, birthdays now have raised, oh, 70 or $80 million. Um, 70 or $80 million. Yeah. And, what I and, loved about it in the book, I think you're like the entrepreneur's entrepreneur, even though you're working in a nonprofit context. You had everybody manually create these birthday pages before you built the software. Yeah, yeah, HTML page, unique pages. I was like, yeah. Jason, can you send me a picture and yeah. can you write a mission statement? And then we yeah. would type that in the HTML. You made like and 92 of button. those in the first yeah. whatever month. Yeah, it was and the then least scalable software. thing we've ever done. Yeah, well, that's, I mean, that's kind of how startups work. You just do it non-scalable. If you get traction with the market, then you yep. productize it. And we did. A seven-year-old kid in that first month went out and raised twenty-two thousand dollars. Crazy in Austin, 70. Texas. He was knocking on doors, and he was getting seven-dollar gifts and seventy-seven-dollar gifts, and you know, it was a nice neighborhood. A couple seven seventy-sevens, but Amazing. just the passion of a child to say, "I don't need gifts. I don't need." Uh, a party like people uh, crying out loud kids don't even have clean water so if i could use my birthday for good if i could turn it into a generous unselfish redemptive giving moment yeah and involve my friends and family in it then who wouldn't want to do that i want to tell you about a secret weapon i have here at inside.com my company and this secret weapon is called rippling you know rippling r-i-p-p-l-i-n-g.com Every minute you spend updating your company's employee data and systems is a minute that you're not spending on your core job, whatever product or service you're trying to introduce into the world. Thankfully, there's Rippling. It's the first and only platform that combines HR and IT. And they just put them right together. These are two things that are arduous and painful for every founder. What if you could just have those two things off your plate and done perfectly without errors and quickly? Well, now you can. Imagine you hire somebody in just 90 seconds. You take care of their HR, payroll, health insurance, 401k, and that's not it. Then you get all their IT stuff done. You order their computer and you instantly set up their accounts in the most common apps that we all use like Gmail, GitHub, Slack. And it's all in one simple onboarding flow. And that's why it won PC Magazine's Editor's Choice Award. And it's the top rated HR and IT software on G2 Crowd. Here's an example of an employer employee contract being signed for inside.com. Tell us about yourself. Boom, you put your address in, you sign the documents. Boom, here we go. And we're done. We get everything done. We're hiring somebody, putting in their title, they sign everything, and boom. We're back to work on what we're building at Inside. It's a seamless experience and everything is in one place. So if you're looking for an easier way to supercharge your employees and have your HR and IT run like a well-oiled machine, I want you to go to rippling.com slash twist and get 20% off. That's right, rippling, R-I-P-P-L-I-N-G.com slash twist and you're going to get 20% off. That's an incredibly generous offer, rippling.com slash twist, get 20% off. Okay, thanks Rippling for supporting the podcast and for supporting my company, inside.com and making us bionic. Like we're superhuman now. Okay, let's get back to this amazing podcast. Yeah, it makes total sense. And then you also, in the book, and this is the part I got choked up at this morning when I was taking my daughters for a walk. Mm. Uh, there was a nine-year-old yeah, who was, was raising money. Little girl named, and, and this was an extraordinary nine-year-old. Yeah. Um, Same age but, as my daughter, my oldest, yeah. Yeah, yeah. mine's, uh, my daughter's, three at the moment so yeah. i'm hoping she grows up to be this special but yeah i had um i'd spoken in seattle as a big group this nine-year-old was in the audience and at the end i challenged everyone to donate their birthdays and she says i'm going to give away my ninth birthday cancels her party won't accept gifts and only raises 220 dollars, which was shy of her goal of 300 dollars so she's bummed. She tells yeah. her mom, she feels like she has yeah. let people down in Africa that don't have yeah. clean water by her not reaching the $80 to get right. to that $300 goal, which today would get 10 people clean water. And, uh, you know, she tells her mom, hey, I'm going to try harder the next year. Um, right after her birthday, she's killed. There's a terrible car accident. Uh, it was a pileup on a Seattle interstate. She's the only fatality as a tractor trailer jackknife. And her, her sister was in the car in the front seat. Her mom was driving and then she's yeah. killed in the back. And I was in Africa at the time. I landed in New York, I turned on my phone and, and got a text from her pastor saying, hey, this little girl in my church died. She was fundraising for you. Her last wish was for kids to get clean water. Can we honor her legacy and reopen that campaign? Yeah. And it was amazing, Jason. I mean, 
nine dollar donations started coming in from this little church community yep. and then from the seattle community it made the seattle news and then the new york times picked it up and today's show picked it up start spreading into europe uh i'm watching people in africa later start donating so there's people in africa that get a hold of this story and yeah. they're giving nine dollars so she goes from 220 dollars that she saw when she was alive to 1.3 million wow and what she legacy, inspired, yeah. I think, of, I think it was forty thousand complete strangers yeah. to give in honor of her. So it was, I and mean, you met with her mom. And yeah, you I were got very to take deli her. delicate about the situation. You didn't yeah. want to be, like, I guess there's a fear of capitalizing sure. on the story or hijacking her story. Sure, and you had to be very delicate about that, and you were. Yeah, um, and, and this was something that the family was really, the family was you know, driving, was, yeah. was driving. Yeah. Um, and of course, our staff wound up giving, and, and my wife and I wound up giving, and we we got to, on the one-year anniversary of her death, so exactly a year later after the car accident, I got to take her mom, single mom, and uh, her grandparents to meet the thousands of kids that had clean water. Wow. So we fast-tracked all those projects, wow. and they went village to village to village. And there was, I read about this in the book, but there was this one memory I have of walking into a village that now had clean water because of Rachel, because of this nine year old. Yeah. And we roll in with, with Samantha, Rachel's mom and the village elders, the, the women start throwing themselves at her feet, kissing her feet. Wow. And through translators, they say, we, we understand your pain. We have lost wow. children, but your daughter's death brought our children life. And we're Incredible. grateful for that. And I, I just remember, it. you know, this this connection of moms yeah. and trauma and death and loss, but also yeah. life. So it was a, there was a lot of crying. Oof. That I mean, you That's were crying. Really, I was bawling that whole week. It's incredible when you think about like when you start something like you did and it becomes a phenomenon. The unexpected moments that will occur. That's a totally unexpected moment that became. I think probably one of the tipping points of what you were doing as a project. Yeah, I think so. I think yeah. it got out there and, and so many, what was really cool was we just ran the data set recently and we looked at all of the donors to Rachel's campaign. Yeah. And these are people just giving $9. Yeah. And we said, hey, did any of them also give up their birthday? They had. Wow. And they'd raise over another 2 million. Wow. So her impact now is over 3.3 million. So this is a little girl yeah. that wanted to raise $300 now has a growing impact of over 100,000 people with clean water. She she would have helped 10. Yeah. And she's helped over 100,000 people get clean water. Let me ask a stupid question. And the last thing, yeah, I think okay. it's what, what, what I love about that story is she disrupted in such a positive way so many people going about their lives. Yeah. Thinking about themselves, you know, the car that they're going to buy or the house that they're going to buy or, sure. you know, the promotion at work. And there's something about the innocence of a child, a nine-year-old who should want, yeah. you know, the toys or the party. Like yep. nine-year-old kids want parties. You have yeah, kids? I have of kids. Of course, like, yeah. My kid's asking me for Legos and, yeah. you know. And for some reason, she, the, like the purity and the innocence of her heart to say, no, yeah. others are more important than me. Right. I think just messed up 40,000 people yeah. a little bit and said, we need to do something. Yeah. And I would hope that she has an even bigger benefit in just the the, the frame that she, the, the thinking that hopefully she just shifted a little bit for some of those people I, that yeah, said, I want to be like that nine-year-old. It is fascinating when you think about how great we have it here in America. Mm -hmm. And I guess the developed world is how yeah. the politically correct yeah. way to say it today. Yeah. We don't use the term third world. We say emerging markets. What do we say? Developed world. What do you call the developing the developing world? None okay. of this is very PC. I mean, none of it really works. If <laughs> Listen, if but yeah, people care about words a whole sure. lot, and they don't care sure. about intent these days. So I like to get it right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So developing world and the developed world. When you think about the developed world and how narcissistic people are, that they're actually depressed and anxious about how good they have it. And then there's a whole other 600 million people, two times the size of America, who don't have clean water. And we're upset about our school traffic. loans, traffic, our latte being wrong, whatever it is. Oh my God, I don't have a big enough apartment, whatever. It's Getting just, our kids into the perfect schools, right? Oh my God, yeah, that's I that's mean, there's crazy. so many girls that are dropping out because they have to carry water six hours a day. They don't even get a chance to go to school. You told that story too. To of, a primary school, you know? Tell that story from the book. That's another one that is just- well, you, This is heavy. We're gonna have to like find no, some No, I think heavier. we should go right into it because people need to understand exactly how goddamn yeah, how privileged they are. If you're listening to this, you probably have AirPods, which cost 200 bucks. 
Yeah. And you probably have an iPhone it's 10. Eight people with water. Yeah. And an iPhone 10 that costs 1200 300 people with water. And a $100 mm. a month, you know, phone bill for 1200 again for the year. And yeah. every two years you're buying a well. That's right. Pretty easy, right. right? The wells still go for about 5K on average. They're a little 10K. more. They're about 10 now. Yeah. Um, but anyway, tell the other story. So let's just get it. Look, so, you know, water, if you don't have water, again, this is so difficult because uh, America officially has 100% water coverage. Yeah. And, you know, a handful of people died in Flint. Um, 10 times that amount have died since we've started talking worldwide. So How many people think, a day die? Because you, you say this in the uh, book. It used to be 4,500 a day. That's come 4, down. 4,500. So now it's um, half that. Was the st- I remember that yeah. stat because we ran it on buses yeah. in the beginning. 4,500. Uh, it, it's less now, but it's 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 um, it's a lot of, it's, it's the thousands way you phrased of people it, that are dying every day. The way you phrased right. it in the book was so impactful, I think. Uh, if 10 or 11 Airplanes like jumbo carrying jets. Ch- jumbo yeah. jets carrying kids crashed a day. We we do something, right? But because it's water, and, and it's again, hard for us to think about it. There's so many of these issues, yeah. right? When you yeah. bring in the statistics that, yeah. uh, you know, you could say, "Wow, this is on fire. This is an emergency. Yeah. Why aren't we doing something?" But if you don't have water, uh, so it's it's a couple of things about it. Um, it affects women and children. So it is exclusively an issue around the world that ex- that affects the women and the girls. I've now been to 69 countries. I've been to Ethiopia 31 times since starting Charity Water. I just never see men get the water. So culturally, if I'm in Africa or South America or India or Southeast Asia, it's the women and the girls that are out there getting the water. Carrying right? the water. Carrying 40 pounds of water. So They're this literally is, carrying the water. Like they it's are. A, not a Now, let euphemism. me play this a little. Yeah. So now we hear stories of rape. Right. Okay, you're four hours away from your home. We hear stories of hyena attacks at the water hole because you're sharing often these rivers or swamps with the animals. Right. Hyena attacks, crocodile attacks, yeah. lion attacks. I mean, again, you know, mind blowing. A middle class person listening to this is like, when's the last yeah. time you thought about getting attacked by a hyena or raped when you went to get water? Yeah, they are thinking about if they're wireless charging or not, or what percentage their battery is, so they can get their or our next Snapchat story. Or our internet seat is too slow. Yeah. I mean, look, our I have Wi-Fi to deal is with all terrible. This too. Like, you know, we're yeah. my wife and I are having these same conversations because we yeah. this is our context. Yeah. So, okay, it's a, it's a women and girls issue. It's a health issue. Uh, when we started, 52% of the disease in the world was related to bad water. So wow. half the people in the hospital beds in the world could be sent home if they clean water and sanitation. So right. toilets are also important. It's, a, it's an education issue as well because uh, one out of every three schools in the world not only don't have clean water, they also don't have toilets. So men, imagine sending your nine-year-old, oh, yeah, soon yeah, to yeah. be 13 or 15, to a school yeah. one week a month with no toilet and with no water. Insane. She's not going. So she's going to school three weeks a month, uh, falling behind in her studies. Right. Then the cultural pressure of, well, wow, girls are so useful around the house anyway, right. start to push in. So you have this water that affects women and girls. It affects education. It affects health. So many second-order Problems yeah, so occur. this one story yeah. that you mentioned was kind of the, the pinnacle of just human suffering. There was a 13-year-old girl in Ethiopia uh, in, in an area where I've been a lot and where we've worked. And she was, with all the other girls, walking eight hours a day, which, you know, you say eight hours a day. When you really think about it, that's what getting up at four in the morning and reaching the water source at eight and then coming home and it's noon. And you've just spent from four in the morning to noon getting dirty water. So that's what she was doing. It's insane. And yeah. after one of these days, she comes back home. And before she reaches her house, she trips, we think, on a rock on the path. She slips and falls. She smashes her clay pots and she spills all the water that she's just spent eight hours collecting. And this little girl takes a noose and she ties it around her neck and she climbs a tree and she jumps. And they find a 13 year old girl's body swinging. Brutal. Uh, with a noose around her neck. Out of shame or just the, the well, horror went, of losing the water. I went and uh, this story messed with me so much uh, yeah, how could that I, I, I went and lived in the village for a week uh, and I walked in her footsteps and I photographed the tree and I met her best friend that walked with her that day uh, who was still walking. Yeah. It's a crazy thing. So nothing had changed eight years later. And yeah, her friend said, I think it was the shame of letting her family down oh. because she, she was coming home empty handed and she'd broken the pot. You know, it's like crashing the car. Yeah. And, you know, they don't have money for the new car. There's no insurance yeah. 
for the replacement of the clay pot when you're living, you know, at that uh, marginal status. Um, so, yeah, I mean, look, that kind of stuff just, I remember just coming back. How do you deal with all that? Like that anger, you know, I go to anger. Uh, yeah. Uh, anybody that knows the Enneagram, I'm like an eight. I'm like a fighter for, you know, the challenger. Yeah. Like, this is not right. Not on my watch. Yeah. Our 13 year old kids hanging so themselves. You can channel that if anger I can do something into about all this it. action. Yeah. And, and, and the, the, the delicate balance is not turning that into any sort of contempt because yeah, I will go. I mean, Jason, yeah. we, we, we share a lot of the same, uh, friends and, and network. I mean, I will go from a $4 a night hotel room. Yeah to a $40 million house in yeah. 24 hours in Pacific Heights. Yeah. And, you know, I am deeply good friends with the people living in $40 million houses who are very generous. Yeah. And holding that intention without ever saying like, oh, how dare you, right? Right. You know, buy a Lamborghini or, you know, yeah. when people are doing that. So it's, it's trying to just winsomely create um, a flow right. between the affluence and, and the you know, the, the wealth, uh, we all have so much to give. We have yeah. time, we have talent, we have money. So I look at Charity Water's role and the birthdays was just one great way to just allow, yeah. you know, hundreds of thousands of people to participate and saying, what can you do to serve others? And what we'll promise is this cycle of 100% transparency where we'll prove where the money goes and we'll let you know that 100% of the money goes. And that's, you know, that's helped us raise $400 million or so now. One in three Americans doesn't get a good night's sleep. And with founders, I bet you it's two out of three. I deal with a lot of founders calling me up, texting me, emailing me in the middle of the night. You need to sleep. If you don't sleep well, it's going to screw with your cognitive functions. You need to have good decision making. You need to be a good leader. You need to have a good mood. When I don't sleep well, I'm not in a great mood. Trust me, everybody in the office knows when I don't get a good night's sleep. But I have been getting great sleep because I use calm. I stay calm. I do my meditation during the day and I do my sleepscapes and my sleep stories at night. And this library of programming that they put together is amazing. It's just what your brain and your mind and your body needs. Soundscapes are amazing. These are just beautiful sounds that will gently whisk you to sleep, like the rain or the river or the beaches and the wind blowing. It's so beautiful. Go to calm.com slash twist and you're gonna get 25% off a premium subscription. And you don't want that premium subscription because you want to support Calm, which is making all this great content. 40 million people have downloaded Calm and it was Apple's 2017 app of the year. So go find out why everybody is talking about Calm by going to calm.com slash twist. And my CMO, Presh, oh, poor Preshy Poo, he has been having trouble sleeping because his boss is a jerk. Well, he browses the sleep categories and he finds something that might just help him get to sleep that much quicker. He's got options like nonfiction, fiction, ASMR. If you don't know what that is, you can look it up. It's pretty cool. And sleep music. He decides to play sleep music instead of a sleep story tonight. And then he gets up in the morning and tackles his day. Good job, Presh. Com.com slash twist. Let's get back to this amazing program. What is the technical barrier to this clean water? I know you had the observation or the insight that, gosh, the water is two or 300 feet or 50 feet even below people's feet. Why not just do a well? Oh, they're not doing wells there because they don't have the technology, the money, yeah. or the long-term planning. But why is this still an issue? Is this about politics and regions of the world where warlords like you know are not allowing it to happen is it because of abject poverty because it does seem like and listen i'm completely superficial i've never been to africa i've never i have a very superficial knowledge of any of this just what i read it, why isn't this solved already okay well a couple of things it is getting better so when we started there were a billion people without water yeah. that was 12 years ago so we're now down to 660 million and population is growing Okay, so we're seeing. So you're beating population growth. We're beating well, and and we've halved the problem. One point right. two billion, six hundred sixty billion, six hundred sixty million. Um, it costs a lot of money, and in so many of these countries, <laughs> the the need for clean water across their whole country could be more than the GDP. I mean, well, it's, what's it's, the broad strokes if you? had to provide it to those 600 million people would be $100 per person, $1,000 per person, $10 per person to solve it permanently or per year, the maintenance costs. Have it's, you done that calculation? So the, the, there are some new numbers out there. Okay. Um, less than a trillion dollars would bring clean water to the whole world. Got it. 
Um, there's a bunch of different numbers. We're currently serving people at about $35 a head. So every $35 the charity water takes in this year. Um, so if someone gives 35 million, we go get a million people access. Someone mm -hmm. gives $35. It's one person. As you solve more and more of the problem, the costs actually go up. So you have a reverse economy of scale because you have the capital cost of whatever the right solution is. And we're solution agnostic. We fund wells, bio sand filters, rainwater harvesting, um, I was in Rwanda two weeks ago looking at $1.2 million huge gravity-fed systems that are taking little networks of tap stands down to the communities. Uh, so all, all that kind of blends out currently to 35 a person. It'll go up to 40 and 50 and 60. Because those people have the... Those are the hardest problems to solve. Maybe it's a smaller, smaller population. Small population. When you did your first yeah. well 10 years yeah. ago, let's say in a region of Ethiopia, yeah. your well was going to help 350 people. We were right. knocking out the most populated villages. You do a well today, it might serve 250 people. Got it. Now you could argue $40 a person, Who cares? you know, 10 lattes to get someone clean water. Like yeah, no what a steal. Right. I mean, no one's complaining about the cost to deliver clean it's water. It's kind of like broadband in that way that the last... 10% are so far away that right. getting it to them is hard. Now, I, I mentioned that we'd made a lot of progress on this issue over yeah. 12 years. One of the challenges is that most of the people that did get access lived in the urban and the peri-urban areas, so cities and towns. So Wait, now- Urban, and what was the other word? Peri-urban, uh, peri cities and towns. Got it. So peri -urban now- Peri-urban is the word for that, peri? Peri-urban would be uh, not a, like not an Addis Ababa, but a, a sub-city. Got it. Um, now, 82% of the people alive that don't have clean water live in the remote rural areas. Ah. So really last month. So harder work begins. Yeah. That's where we've always been focused. So Charity Water's always been rural. We're seeing the government money go into the cities. That's where the voters live. It's easier to do these big, sexy infrastructure projects. Sure. Um, to dot the countryside, these subsistence farmers, and help them is a lot harder. Mm. So that's where we focus our energy. But it's a solvable problem. And the, the last thing I'd say is about this is that there is not a single person alive that we don't know how to help. So I just lost my mom recently to pancreatic cancer. We did not know how to help solve late stage pancreatic cancer. Right. Okay. And she went to doctors and did chemo and radiation and she died four months after diagnosis. Water is not like that. Right. So there's no human being alive today that with money, we couldn't go and help. Mm. We couldn't go filter their water. We couldn't go provide them with a sustainable solution. So that's the great thing about working on it is we're not looking for a, a maybe cure to a disease yeah, there's in a no lab or a test tube. Yeah. The money turns into results immediately. Very sorry about your mom. My, both my parents are cancer survivors. And in that case, you were talking about spending tens to hundreds of thousands of dollars to delay or, or maybe solve for cancer um, or, or manage it. And in here we're talking about forty dollars. Yeah, to solve ju it, yeah, just my point is that we yeah. know how to do it. So yeah. it's really about raising the awareness, building the movement of people to to also say, hey, not on our watch are our kids, you know, having seventeen hundred dollar birthday parties while kids, you know, a world away, just born in a different environment, are dying of diarrhea and dysentery because yeah. they're drinking brown water. What percentage are in Africa? Is this an, uh, about a third in Africa? Yeah, about a third in India now. Rural uh, India and about a third in Southeast Asia and a little bit in Central and South America. Interesting. Is the, I would say that the 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 most extreme need that I've seen is still Sub-Saharan Africa. It is those eight hour walks. It's hmm. I was with a woman in Niger that I write about in the book where uh, she lost eight kids. She watched eight of her children Ugh. die and she's standing next to brown, disgusting, like almost chocolate. Like chocolate milk would have been thinner right. than the consistency of this water. A stupid question about technology, because we in the startup community, a lot of times we think there must be a technical solution to this. Um, and I I get pitched regularly about desalinization sure. and um, pulling the water out of the air. Yeah, out of the sky, yep. Uh, which is, um, what do they call that? Well, there's a bunch of companies. So yeah. I, I just had a guy who won a million dollar prize from one of those companies sitting yeah. in the office. And when he looked at the technology that he'd built so far yeah. to the technology of a well, he was at about 100x the cost. To do the pulling water from the air or whatever. So just 100x in yeah. what you know, would, would be 100 times too expensive right. for that local. So you know, if Moore's Law, can, I mean, if, if he continues to advance, in the technology. So we're we're looking at all this stuff. We're looking at filters. Um, we're, we're definitely meeting, but 
it's there was not, always this talk about filters too. Like they somebody built that straw and you're gonna be able to like the life straw. The but life it only straw. works for a year and then you gotta replace it. Got it. Does it and actually you work? Money, like you can does. you can oh, stick I, the I straw one. into it absolutely works. So you camping, wow. you should have one in your back pocket. If you when I was living off the grid in this village in Ethiopia yeah. where the thirteen year old girl died, I had one of those. I had a I could filter the river water and I was completely fine. Now my device cost enough for three people to get clean water. Right. in that village but i was born into a middle class family right and i've never had to drink dirty water in my in my life because of the the privilege i was born into how much of this is related to governments that are controlling those areas because that's another myth maybe yeah. or or just a story that we hear like oh there's no way to help them because the government's oh, not going to warlords going to yeah. stop them is that I, true or not I, I try to talk about the bright spots in the book um, yeah. rwanda is a great example so rwanda for for 10 years now has been matching charity water dollars 90 cents on the dollar 45 cents on the dollar coming from federal budget 45 cents from the district so we've put in about 13 million dollars uh, of rural water supply and the government's put about 11 million so they have so little money but they're trying to use it to show the outside world to attract outside philanthropic capital saying we are not asking you to do anything we're not willing to do ourselves but we really need help here it's a country where i think 95 percent of the people are subsistence farmers so you, yeah. you just think about the economy. They're living off of their own land. So there's there are a lot of bright spots of good governments that are d working with us. I mean, we, we now have eight drilling rigs in Ethiopia. We've shipped three new rigs there over the last couple of years. Our rigs are through customs in days. There's no red tape. There's, there's a sense of the government of like, great, new asset coming in. Let's put it to work to help our people. Nice. How long did it take? take? Take me through the mechanics of drilling one of these wells. I know this might sound boring. No, in a way, no, no. But I think it's kind of interesting for people to understand. You tell them this about a particular village where it was kind of sticky and hard. They had tried two or three times yeah. over 17 or 18 years. Yeah. Somewhere in the 18th so or 19th year. It's not always groundwater. Not always um, groundwater. We're yeah. successful nine out of 10 times. So if we go and try and drill 10 holes in the ground mm -hmm. in 10 different villages, nine of them we're going to find water mm -hmm. just across the portfolio. Um, sometimes that one that we didn't find water, we can try in a different spot. So it's not always a lost cause there. Mm. But uh, if let, let's say, um, okay, we have, let's just pick one drilling rig in Ethiopia. So million dollars to buy the drilling rig, the compressors, the trucks to train the team, all that. So now you have a million dollar asset, which is going to go drill wells for 20 years. It's going to drill about 90 wells this year. So over 10 years, 900, over 20 years. What does years, that rig cost? Million, million bucks. The wells are going to cost 10 grand, let's say. So it looks like, let's say you're the head driller and you jump into your million dollar piece of machinery with your compressors and trucks and your team of seven and you roll into my village and I've never had clean water my whole life. And we've heard that there's this team coming. You know, We've all been asked to help bring cement and gravel and sand and to, uh, to provide housing for the drillers who are going to be living there. And your rig rolls in to the spot that we've all agreed where the well should be, where they think there's water. Uh, my community has set up a water committee, which is going to manage that project so that it's sustainable. And then I watch you jump out with your other six uh, co-workers and you start just looking for water and you're going deeper and deeper about a day. So if you start at 10 a.m. on a Thursday, there's a good chance that that is wet by 10 a.m. Wow. the next day. Wow. And then there's this amazing moment, which there's a couple photos in, in the book where, and, I, and I've been there for these celebrations. So now we've huddled around. So you've got 300 people watching your work. Yeah. Right. And we're all anxious. Like, is it, is it, are they going to hit water? Or are they going to, is yeah. it dry? Are we the nine out of 10 or the one out of 10? Yeah. And then you hit water. And what happens is now you've, you've tapped into the water in the aquifer, call it 150, 180 feet deep. So just imagine taking a, elevator down 18 floors yep and there's a massive amount of water there and then you flush it out so you start cleaning it Boom. and you get this eruption when you put the compressed air down the hole right and three 300 people start cheering, cheering. and they'll sometimes dance and clap and there'll be a and that party means they don't have to walk days. an hour or four each way to get water yeah your rig possibly. is there for two to three days you're flushing out the Amazing. hole and then you move on to the next one but it's crazy there's a moment in the story where somebody sued you yeah, like ten years ago. Yes, because we got fluoride in the in the wells. Well, was yeah, that would, but this was a, somebody who donated money mm -hmm. was upset with you that one hundred percent of the time you didn't hit water, 
and that you were a naive person who didn't understand the Africa and drilling wells. Yeah. To which your attorney told you, you're a club promoter who started a nonprofit. <laughs> of course, you don't know anything about this. You're trying your best. You, yeah, you need I mean, not hit water every time. What happened with that insane lawsuit? Who are these insane people? Well, I, I'm, I'm certainly not going to name names. I, you know, I thought about, look, when I wrote the book, I really wanted it to be hopefully a playbook for aspiring social entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. You know, the kids that are um, entering college or leaving college who might say, I look at this suffering around the world. What can I do about it? Right. And I also wanted to let them know how hard it was going to be because right. it is extraordinarily you will get soon. hard. It is extraordinarily yeah. hard. No good deed goes unpunished. So we were early on and let me just explain how naive I was. Yeah. So I'm a club promoter living on a closet floor. I've got this crazy 100% model, which means that none of the r money that I raised from the public yeah. can I use to pay a salary for a team yeah. or an office one day. Yeah. So your $15,000 went straight through. Right. Actually, even worse, we said that we're going to be so emphatic about the integrity of the 100% model that we'll pay back credit card fees. So you probably gave the 15 Gs on your Amex, which right, means I course. got 14 and change. I had to go raise the money to make up the 3% credit yeah. card fee. And right about so that now, I could you're send looking at your yourself 2, like, why didn't I just say... 10% goes to operations capped. So, well, there was just something black and white. There was I something, know. and even to this day, KPMG audits our bank accounts yeah. separately 13 years later and puts the opinion on the website, all the financial stuff. So anyway, so early on, so I'm like, okay, I've got this mission. I've got this 100% model. I think we can disrupt giving. I think we can win back the 70%, some of the 70% of people who think charities waste their money. Yeah. Some of the 42% of people who, who should be giving. They actually want to be giving. They just don't trust. Um, but who's going to trust a club promoter to go yeah. pick water charities? Like, I don't know anything about hydrogeology, right. or at least I didn't at the time. So I, I call up the CEO of Charity Navigator and I said, this is your job. Like you rate charities all day long. Yeah. Can you help me pick four of the best water charities? So this guy, Trent Stamp, he lives in LA now, uh, comes over to the apartment at the time where I'm sleeping on the closet floor. And you know, he thinks he's coming into a charity office. He sees some kid sitting on a couch on a laptop and I give him my big vision. I'm going to help bring clean water to the world. I want to raise, you know, billions of dollars and give it all to the people that need it most through this 100% model. Anyway, I think he says, sure, kid, but he gives me four. Hmm. Two of them turned out to be really lousy. Huh. Uh, local partners who could drill wells who just did a really poor job. Two of them we're working with to this day, and we've done tens of millions of dollars. Amazing. But I didn't know. They were all four star, four out of four star charities. And I thought that that's what mattered. So one of these partners, we had done a big campaign. It was a corporate uh, family business. We'd given them uh, $700,000 of the donor's money. We'd given them another $500,000 of our own money raised from the public. And they did pretty mediocre to poor work yeah. and hadn't prepared us for any risk that drilling in the Rift Valley of the specific area yeah. that we were passionate about has a very high propensity for fluoride that is so high it's damaging. We think of fluoride is good, a little bit is good, yeah. too much rots your teeth or bows your legs. Hmm. So uh, I, some percentage of these wells um, that was not 2% or 5%, um, I don't remember at the time, maybe it was 20% yeah. or, or so, had serious problems with them. Yeah. And we went back being all gung-ho transparent saying, yeah. you know, hey, here's the problems. And we just got smacked hammered. down. We got right. hammered. So for being transparent and honest, she gets um, smacked but down. But we hammered. were naive. And I really yeah. wanted to kind of, you know, put that on the record. And we, you If know, you weren't we, naive, you probably would not have taken on such a crazy project. Yeah. Like it's the, certain... The beauty is, and why I wanted to tell the story, because it's funny, I called up um, Daniel Eck from Spotify at the time, who was one of our, our big donors on the overhead yeah. side. And he's like, dude, I get sued once a week. Yeah, he's, he's like, like, calm like, down. Don't, don't worry. He's Slow like, you, your you, roll. You, you've made You're it. Because you know? I was like, oh my gosh, someone like wants me out of business. Accountability is critically important for your startup. You have to assign tasks, you have to assign projects, you've got all different phases of things you're trying to deploy at your startup, and monday.com is going to allow you to do this. It's beyond just task management. You create boards, you can do your own, or you can do it from a template, and it's really popular with non-tech teams as well as tech ones, and it replaces all these burdensome Excel files where you're putting checklists and punch lists in Excel, and then, or maybe in a Google Sheet, and you're trying to make that work. No. You want to use 
www.mondaymonday.com. And Ben Seidel, who's been on the program and is in our portfolio from Neighborly, he uses it to plan the build outs of the new venues that he's creating at Neighborly. And he can assign accountability. And if people don't get something done, you know who's responsible. So you can go have that little chit chat and do a walk and talk. Pete Davis from Ampjar, another one of our high growth uh, startups. He went through our incubator. He's from Sydney. He uses it for the growth marketing project management he's doing. You do growth marketing. You know how much work that is. Well, here's how easy it is. Here's my CMO, Presh, creating a board. Uh, and he's doing this for open office hours, which you guys have been experiencing when I uh, do open office hours. And he's assigning tasks. He's setting up a type form integration. They have all those great integrations. So you can see all the status of the founders and their biggest challenges coming into that monday.com board. He's going to make the board public. And we're going to do this ourselves here. We're going to have a public board where you can see the topics that are going to be discussed. Go see it right now. Officehours.launch.co slash August. I want you to start a 14-day free trial by going to monday.com, the day of the week, monday.com. What a great domain name. Slash twist. That's monday.com slash twist. And use the promo code twist when you're ready to buy and you'll get 10% off a paid account. Thank you for that, Monday. Great product, great software. I met the team the other day. Wow, really impressive progress. Uh, and everybody go ahead and try it. Okay, let's get back to this amazing episode. I think my favorite moment in your book, uh, and for those people who are listening, do get the Audible. Uh, go to audible.com slash twist and you'll get a free book i think that's link is still good uh thirst by scott harrison Thanks, Jason. Uh, the founder or co-founder actually of charity water yeah my wife your uh, wife is a I co-founder I she started a, as a designer yeah you married her i married her married my second employee that's another story for the book yeah and then you gave her uh when she i guess she was having your second kid you gave her yeah. the business cards with co-founder yeah her you last her, day at the office yeah, after nine years a charming of work story yeah. yeah she she earned it yeah, she definitely did. Um, she's now doing branding for startups and is doing her own, own amazing. Thing. Yes. Um, so I think one of my favorite moments in the book: you're out of money because you did this crazy yeah. idea. Yeah, I was gonna say stupid, but it, yeah, yeah, it was kind of stupid. Let's yeah. be honest. Yeah, <laughs> you're like a business model. We're a hundred percent of the money you raise. Yeah. You can't use to run so your. You business. have this crazy <laughs> idea that you're going to hire a staff but not be able to pay them from the money people are giving you to do that behavior. Crazy slash stupid idea, naive idea, whatever. Um, Still sounds stupid. Uh, It still sounds pretty stupid to me, I'll be honest. But But it's working for you, so it's fine. Um, But actually, just for a pause, if people want to know how we do that. So in that other bank account, the overhead bank account, um, we have found 136 amazing entrepreneurs and families to back the staff. They give you a thousand dollars a month or something. You it's have more. A, it's a hundred a year. A hundred thousand a year. And up. Wow. So they're paying effectively for you know staff. Members. How many staff do you have now? About a hundred in New York. You have a hundred people. Seventeen hundred around the world. Wow, this has gotten giant. We raised about four hundred million dollars now. To date, yeah, four hundred. We'll about eighty million this year. That's mind-blowing. Which is enough to get 2 million people clean water this year. Yeah, we're helping right now. I um, I just heard this stat. We're helping over 5,000 people every single day get clean water this year. Wow. So like by the new end people. of today, new people. New people a day. Yeah, so it's like filling up Madison Square Garden every three and a half days for Staples Center. It's crazy. Center. It is 18,000. So that's people, the yeah. that's the cool uh, KPI for us. But anyway, so there's a so it's been the founders of Twitter and Facebook and Spotify and WordPress and people like uh, like Chris Sacco who's been yeah. with us for ten years and Blake at Tom's and I probably fifty of your guests yeah. would be grouped in that 136. No, I know because every and time I see them, I have to give another wow because <laughs> everybody's so passionate well, about they're where paying you're for the overhead, so they want I to know, give they you want... this pure play. So, which is great. Those 136 yeah. families have allowed it now uh, for a million plus donors to get mm. this pure play. So that's how we do it today. But yes, we almost ran out of money. And, and this a... is a great moment where you go see Michael and Sochi Birch from uh, Bebo. Yeah, this well, dates not... the story. This does. So this is year two of Charity Water. We've actually raised a couple million dollars for clean water. So right. that's working. The 100% model has traction. You can't pay traction. your rent or payroll. Right. So I've got nine Oops. employees. Um, I'm about to miss payroll. And remember, running these two bank accounts uh, that, that don't connect to each other. And I'm running around doing the overhead separately. So I've yeah. been really doing that for 12 years. It's my job to find these families who can invest in the people. Hmm. Uh, I treat them like investors. That's what I'm out here doing today. It's, I'm on a plane to San Francisco at 6 a.m. to go and see six more, updating those investors on how we're, how we're spending their money. Yeah. So 
Yeah, this is before any of that. So I have no program, no 136 families, and I'm about to miss payroll. And the, the funny thing was the advice I was getting from most business people was to go and break the 100% model. They're like, we had $881,000 in this bank account, hmm. which was eight months of operating burn. Yeah. Could have made payroll for you know the next yeah. eight months. And they're like, well, just go borrow, dude. Like money's fungible. Come on. You'll pay it back. You have the best. You're helping yeah. people get clean water. Yeah. And I remember thinking, if we borrowed one penny ever in the history of this organization yeah. from the public's money, from Jason's three wells or $15,000, we should all resign in shame. There yep. would be a crack in the core of our integrity and the foundation. We should all go home. So I was going to shut Charity Water down, send out the $881,000 to drill as many wells as it could, and then say, my, my stupid yeah. business model didn't work. Yeah. Right? It's just too hard to mm -hmm. run these two separate uh, donor propositions. And uh, before that, I had, as I was trying to scale the birthday idea, I'm glad that you got there. Uh, I remember Google. So I thought, well, how do I get more people excited about giving their birthdays? Yeah. So I Google top five social networks. At the time, Perfect. number one was MySpace. Yeah. Which, so I, I write Tom a cold email. Number two is Facebook. I write Zuck. Number three was Bebo. I'd never heard of Bebo. Yeah. Big in the UK, a little bit Huge in here. Huge in the UK, yeah. I go on whois.net and I scrape you know, the domain registry before they were all masked yep. and I get Michael's email address, Michael Birch, and I write him an email and then I write Friendster, which was number four. I don't remember number five. And uh, Michael's the only one that writes me back. And I said, you know, I'm this kid, just got back from Africa as a photojournalist. I used to be a club promoter. I hated my life. And now I want to help people get clean water. Will you help me ask everybody on Bebo to give up their birthday? Yeah. And he writes me back and says, uh, I love your idea. I can't help you, um, but keep going. Yeah. This was six months before the moment where we ran out of money. Yeah. We're running out of money and I get a cold email from him back saying, um, hey, I'm going to be in New York. I'd love to meet you. Yeah. And we have this two hour meeting. I think he hates me. I mean, he's the potential investor, yeah. right? I'm pitching. I've got the laptop. We're in this yeah. crappy office. There's nine staff. There's five interns. And, you know, he's got this very British draw. He just said, I don't trust charities. And, you know, I just I think this is going terribly. Um, Two days later, uh, he sends me an email at midnight and says, really enjoyed meeting you. I wired a million dollars into your overhead account. Crazy. And I remember logging on to the bank account and I'd lost it. I was like weeping. It's I mean, crazy. to go from bankrupt to your idea that was working in one hand, it was getting so much traction. Yeah. But yet I couldn't do two things at the same time fast enough and to have someone believe in me and say, hey, here's over a year's worth of funding. You just need more time. You're like a master networker. I very rarely meet somebody who's so good at networking that I'm impressed. But it's around a good cause, I think. No, Maybe of that's course. what helps people want to help us. I mean, I get to bring out No, I know, but how did you get people. that networking thing? Probably through the clubs. The I clubs mean, to be thing. a club promoter, you're, you're, I worked at 40 different nightclubs in New York. So you are mm -hmm. trying to host people and bring them in. You're trying to include them. You're trying to give them an amazing experience. Um, in that case, with lots of drugs and, you know, cute boys and cute girls and, yeah. you know, alcohol, high-end alcohol. Models, actors. But now it's about yeah. trying to call forth, like, the generosity and the compassion and the empathy uh, and, and allowing people to feel really good about giving. You've also and got that showmanship, though. Like, I was, I remember when you, when you do your annual benefit. The gala, yeah. The gala. Um, people come from all over to go to that thing. It's gotten huge. Yeah, I know. We and sell you, out so early, though. Yeah, and you did it like two or three years ago. You did a live satellite feed yeah. of a well. It's pretty cool. That was, one of the, that was one of my favorite things. Like, you know, and then you took all the 40 major donors and you matched them each with people in the audience yeah. on an iPad with a video. So if you and Actually, I were- all 400 people. All 400 people, you Everyone matched them. Everyone coming to the gala got matched with a person about their age. So right. if you'd come with your wife and you know a couple of kids, I would have tried to match you and your wife with the same couple type with two kids around and your you age. And you shot their, that video of the people in that village talking yeah. and saying, hey, Jason and Jade, thanks so much for coming, mm -hmm. blah, 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 blah. And so everybody takes out the iPad, they start weeping because of the personalized message. And, I and just then asked you for 30 bucks. I said, hey, look, you're all, people are here in black tie. We're at the Metropolitan Museum of Art and the Temple of Dender, right? Yeah. I said, look, 
Um, many of you probably came prepared to give more, but it actually will only cost $30 to give your person right. that I've matched you with in this village. So we just handed out iPads and said, hey, Jason, hey, Jade, she would have had a different one. Yeah. She would have been matched with a different woman. You right. would have matched with a guy. Um, so Jade's husband. Yeah. I said, just click here if you're willing to give 30 bucks. And of course, we instantly funded that well, which specifically cost 12 grand in that village. And as everybody said yes to the $30, all 400 faces on a screen went from black and white to color. Wow. So we'd instrumented the link. And then uh, it was so cool. It was around 9.30 at night in New York, which meant it was 6.30 a.m. in Ethiopia in this village. Wow. And we said, okay, um, let's go see what you've done. And we open up a live satellite feed. And everybody it's at the a high net, risk maneuver. Well, there were, t yeah, there were 10 attempts. That's a high risk maneuver. And... Oh my gosh. Going we, live is hard enough, but you're going live and saying, yeah, and 50 of show the test, me the water come out of the- Yeah, that you just paid well. for. There was no backup. 50% yeah. of the satellite tests failed. We did right. it. Of course, we did the satellite going to tries, Ethiopia. And this was the 11th live in front of 400 people in black tie at the Met who had just given crazy. money and we got it. And it the opened crowd up. The crowd was crazy. And, we, and then we shot the clean water out of the-, the wow. ground. People were weeping. I remember I was weeping. I was on stage. Yeah. And I had given for one of those people specifically. And then I just turned around to the audience and said, you've seen the power of clean water for one person, for one community, give what's in your heart. And we raised millions in the next minute. Crazy. As people went from $30 to 300,000 or 100,000. See, I like the way you did it. I hate going to these charity things. And then they're just like, what would you like? And then they start doing these auctions and they start like yeah. hitting you up. Like it's like all kind of like but you a little bit too much watch, showmanship. Dude. You don't want to go to buy yeah. a Hublot no. at a charity auction. You no. want to go to, you and Jade want to be encouraged to care about an issue, to yeah. care about people. I just want to do it to quietly. Give in, a, yeah. in a self, or, or yeah. give anonymously. Yeah, I prefer at that. all of our galas, you have yeah. an option to So much better. And just click the anonymous. You can have yeah. your name up or you can have your name not up. Yeah, yeah. that's a better way to do it, I think. Yeah. But it's, it's, I mean, it's a, it's a rare moment to be able to include people and the idea of connection that yeah. there are foreigner people who are all husbands and wives and friends and sons and daughters in the same village. You have foreigner people that are all the same. Right. Still human beings just, on the they're planet. They're a dollar a day. They don't yeah, have clean water. And if we could just create the sense of, Hey, we are way more alike then you know we're different and create a way for people to give generously and have 100% of that money flow. Um, it's been fun to do. What is this thing, the spring? I know that's like a big focus Yeah, the for spring. You. So that's the best way that people listening can could, could get involved with us really. Um, think of it as Spotify or Netflix for clean water. So, so it's a monthly just, subscription. There you go. So you, the, the average person listening is going to have 11 subscriptions. Your Dropbox, your HBO, your Showtime, your New York Times, or you know, yeah. whatever your uh, Washington Post or whatever. Uh, we wanted to do that for clean water. So we anchored at $30 a month. Um, we now have 40,000 people across 110 Whoa. countries. So that's like 10, 15 million a year. Uh, it's about 14.6 million. Wow. Um, and the average is $29.40 a month. And you have 100 employees. So. Yeah, but all that money goes out. So if you're sh signing up for $30 a month or $100 a month, every Wait, wait, the spring pedigree. doesn't pay your overhead. Nope, spring goes straight to. So I'm still running the 136 families. Got it. So that's called the well. <laughs> ah, so you got so the spring. The spring is, is just I do for a everybody. subscription to help yep. put and, uh, and wells some, out there. We have college kids giving ten dollars. We have people in their nineties giving ten dollars a month from their pension. We have small businesses doing a hundred dollars a month on their corporate Amex. Hmm. It's really more about the continuity and the giving, which allows us to scale our program. So I've been very like suspect of nonprofits and the whole thing, like the seventy percent of people from that survey. What do nonprofits? do well what have you learned about the nonprofit ecosystem are people correct in not wanting to give money or being concerned about giving money to nonprofits is that correct overall and how can nonprofits do it better is that the best format or b corporations the better format what are you thinking now if you could go back and do it again 12 years in would you do it as a b corp or still go with the nonprofit format yeah i wouldn't change a thing about the format so we've raised 400 million dollars there is a um, I won't name this, but there is a bottled water that is run by one of the biggest corporations in the world, which is a, a charity water. And it gives five cents a bottle. And we started at the same time. So there was a bottle out there saying, buy bottled water. We'll give five cents on every two buck water or so. Yeah. And we had somebody pull the data. It was a little hard. But in that same period of time, one of the biggest corporations in the world, right? multi, multi 
$5 billion market cap has raised about $20 million for clean water. And we raised 400 by asking people just to What are to their give. sales every year? Are they selling like billions of dollars oh, five in? Five cents on, you know. Yeah. So, so they're selling 20 times that. Yeah. I mean, there was just, there was another one uh, in uh, the UK that started uh, at the same time as Charity Water. And same thing, a Charity Water uh, they have now given a total of $1.2 million of their profits. And it was a model where 100% of the profits from the bottled water. So yeah, 100% of the profits. Of you the can profits. always... But you know what I mean? Yeah. So one fortieth. They're taking the salaries and the business class tickets and the... So I'm a big yeah. believer in the nonprofit yeah. model. I think we all could be giving more yeah. to the causes here in our communities, to the people in need that are around us. I think we can be good neighbors. We can outstretch our arms and care for people who are born into extreme poverty. Basic needs like water, great place to start. Um, I think what organizations need to do is just be transparent. Donors are open to myriad value propositions. If I told you right now, if I said, Jason and Jade, uh, my biggest problem right now is that my copy machine is broken and I need a new one and it's $850. Yeah. You would write an $850 million sure. check or $850 check right now to go and fix the copy machine to meet a need. Sure. And you would know that your money is doing that. Yeah. It's giving into the ether. Yeah, that's it's feels... giving into the machine right. that people have a problem with. So these 137 entrepreneurs, they love paying the overhead. They are so excited about knowing that 100% of yeah. their money is paying for the staff and the office and these hardworking, smart people who are getting up every day to see an end of the water crisis. They are paying for the coach flights. I mean, we take stewardship very, seriously. I know, very and you're seriously. like six foot and you're taking all these coach I've flights. I've never bought a business class ticket. We've raised $400 million for myself or anyone else. Yeah. I fly coach. Believe me, if I get upgraded, I take it. Yeah. Um, if Delta wants to put me up there, no I've doubt. flown a million miles with them. No I feel doubt. like I'm happy to take it. But we've, you know, we pay back credit card fees. We take stewardship very, very seriously for those 136 families and growing. What do they call that when people throw like there's some word for not facade or astroturfing? I guess was the term they used for like the green movement when people throw a little charity. Greenwashing. Out. Greenwashing. Yeah, that's it. Right. Yeah. It feels and like I people, think people see through that these days. You know, yeah. we have so many, uh, our, our corporate business of amazing young brands, brands like Away or Quip or, um, you know, The Sill uh, coming to us now, you know, saying, hey, look, we want to do something that matters. And it being really authentic, maybe in a different way than, you know, the Bristol Myers Squibb corporate yeah. responsibility person or, you know, from kind of big corporate. So I think we're seeing a shift in a lot of these young brands, a lot of these young startups saying, we want to do good, mm. we want it to be authentic. Um, and we did something cool with WeWork where we took all of their New York water stations and we wrapped them with charity water. And it, the message was very simple. It said, at WeWork, we don't cl take clean water for granted. 660 million people don't have it. So every month we're donating $30 to the spring for this water station. And that added up, up to hundreds That's of a thousands lot. a year, yeah. whatever, yeah. But it was just a really authentic message. Uh, and and so many people just that are working in WeWorks have said, oh my gosh, we learned about Charity Water by getting tap water from this big station. All right, now you got something a little controversial doing the pool. I, it's controversial for like two people. I okay, mean, that, yeah, I was about to say. Is like it the two fake? other nonprofits. That, okay, it, hold it's on. only the nonprofits don't like what we're doing. Well, of course, you're saying like, don't take business class and don't live in a mansion. And like, I think, yeah, the, their nonprofits are is, paying three, four, five hundred thousand a year for their CEOs. I feel like this is the what least do you feel controversial about that, thing. Hold that on. Let me I think we should pay people more. So we should pay have, people, right? Because they could, they could work in the private sector and make 200, 300,000 yeah. if they were like, you know, somebody with 20, 30 years experience being a CEO. Absolutely. What do you think of them getting paid but the think, same? I don't think they should be paid that much. But Not that I, much. I don't 250K have, a year for a CEO of a- Feels too cheap for me because yeah. that same person would be making, you know, millions plus stock options somewhere else. What do you I get paid? I am not against- You get paid uh, 150? 290 in New York. 290. That's I should it. be in the fours. So they, they benchmark all this. The right. size of your organization, where you live right. in the market. Because I have to say, you would be a killer entrepreneur. If you were doing this, if you raised 400 million for this, you would have a 400 million dollar revenue company pretty easily i'm i'm signed up for this you know and i've given you're not uh, going anywhere i'm not no and i've given uh of my post-tax income i think two hundred thousand dollars to charity water so yeah. i've got 20 wells or 
by your price, done. 40,000. I mean, I believe in it. Like yeah. we, we're, my wife and our givers, we give 20% of our income every year. Okay. To, so what's the pool? Then? And the pool is, I think it's a great idea. We basically said, I think well, it's a killer idea, but explain it to products. Everybody. We've got the well, 136 families and growing. So I'm trying to grow that to 140 and 150. So anybody listening that wants to invest give in a hundred thousand a year. Yep. And it's a three year minimum. So it's a you know, $300,000 dollar check yeah. and you're tax free and you get of course, to of course. come to some cool party. I bet. Then you have a million givers. Uh, the spring people getting their companies involved, yeah. 100% of that going. That's that's water. So we wanted to create a another class for entrepreneurs that are starting their companies mm. that want to connect with Charity Water or mm. find that link, but they can't write a hundred thousand dollar check. Not yet. You know, they can yeah. join the spring, but they want to get involved in a more meaningful way. So we said, why don't we build a venture fund? Let's allow these charity, uh, let's allow these founders to give one percent or more of their equity to Charity Water. Huh. Either write us into the cap table of the VC firm, of the private equity firm, of the cap table of the company that they're starting, or just give their personal shares. So what makes it unique and controversial for two people is that we said, uh, sorry, I'm not being cynical. I'm just thinking of this New York Times article. Which No, there's a New York the, Times article and, and the people- snarky, I'll get to that in a minute because yeah. it, it really- Well, finish what few the- few things gets me, but here's finish the Finish what the okay, program is, yeah. So, uh, 10 startup founders are like, wow, Charity Water's cool. I don't have any money now. I'm building maybe a unicorn or yeah. maybe I go to zero yeah. and I start the next thing. So someone says, I'm going to join the pool. Here's 2% of my equity. Um, sit on it, Charity Water. That would equal 3,429 shares. I hope it's worth something five, seven, 10 years from now. Okay? okay. So we have all these founders that are giving that. What we've done that is a little bit unique is I'm taking 20% of all those shares and I'm giving them to my 100 employees. So your hundred employees will have a little startup Uber, equity, a little WeWork, yeah. a little Casper, a little Rival, a little right. Yeah. We're giving them a now, taste, a little taste. Now, so they don't is, leave and go to that company to get equity. So this is to try and help recruit talent because I am constantly competing with Google, Facebook, Square, sure. Twitter in New York City, ClassPass. I mean, you name it. Away, Casper. Right. These are the comp. This is the talent pool that I'm competing with. I can pay about fifty percent. On comp, right? As I can of of a Facebook. So somebody engineer. who can make one hundred fifty, you can pay him seventy five. Somebody who can get paid two fifty, you can pay him one twenty five. There you go. So there they're taking go. a haircut coming to work. So what I want to do is give them a little bit of upside, a taste in our supporters. Yeah. And what's interesting about the now they get paid based on tenure in a, in a very traditional way and based on org performance. So if we work were to go, you know, all the way up, and while there's a lot of shares for the employees and the org missed its goals getting people clean water, there's no payout. So it's all based on our org performance uh, and then their tenure. And I think the most interesting thing is it's weighted so the lowest paid employees get the highest percentage and the execs get the least. So Got if it. you're making $50,000 as an entry level salary at Charity Water, per the pool, per liquidity event, you can make 50% of your salary. Got okay, it. so you'd get a $25,000 bonus. If you're a C level, you know, making 220, you could only make 20% of your salary. Got it. So it's not the rich get richer, right? Right. It's a, it, and it's, look, none of this is life changing money. Nobody's getting rich. This is not Warner, millionaire yeah. money. Oh, and I'm exempt. So I can never yeah. make a penny. I can never make a penny from the pool. So this is, everybody else is eligible except me. Because I, like I didn't want anyone I, to say. Again, people are cynical. What did oh, this person Scott's say in the New York Times? Like, the only cynical quote in the New York Times came from someone whose base comp is a million dollars in the philanthropic space that said, I think. Enriching employees could be problematic. On a million dollar salary. Oh my God. What a douche. I mean that was I think that was the exact quote. Like that What the, a douche? You know, no, no, no. In enriching uh non New York Times writer was like, in, Wow, you're a douche. <laughs> I mean, that is such so I we haven't we we had no criticism. I mean, people think this. We've now had other nonprofits are yeah. reaching out to us saying, "How did how you have model you structured this? Yeah. It? How do we model it?" Because we have some founders, you know, in our town in Omaha, Nebraska, who are starting companies. Why don't we get one yeah. percent of their equity? Yeah. It's, so I don't think it's controversial at all. We're, the only controversial piece was could you know should we be bonusing our employees? And we're like, well, you yes, cap, but you we, capped it at fifty percent. So it's not like an employee is going we, to magically get ten million dollars. Right, we also have a cap them, right? on total payroll of the organization to keep us within. Mm-hmm. So 
I think it's so the pool. So if anybody's out there building a cool startup and wants to talk to us and help a hundred amazing nonprofit employees in New York have a chance at getting some upside in an amazing and the this companies is that actually are coming a, in. Are, who came up with this idea? You came up with it? Um, it was a, it was an amalgam of a bunch of our well members and uh. you know Daniel Eck from Spotify, Casper uh, Neil from Casper, a bunch of people just said, hey, why aren't you asking us for a little bit of upside? We love your organization. We're building what we think will yeah. be hugely valuable companies. Well, and also if take you, the ride with us. Yeah, it, it kind of allows you to give people the experience of being at one of the tech companies while still staying true to the mission. And maybe you can keep people there for an extra year or two. And when they can do great work in their fifth and sixth year, as opposed to doing it for three years and leaving early. Yeah. And right? this is a way of like, I want to help people make a little money. I'd love that Christmas bonus to be a little more meaningful than yeah. you know, a $500 gift little card. Little money that would I be the out. key in this sentence. I mean, like the max we're yeah. talking about somebody making here is $40,000 a year. It's yes. not like nobody's taking down $10 Correct. million dollars or a million dollars. Correct. And I can and never that make a penny. So, you know, to any, and, and we try to make that clear in the article as well. Like, I, I will be forever exempt. So, lest no one say, oh, you're running around getting all your Silicon Buddy friends, Silicon Valley Buddy People are pretty jealous to, of you, huh? They're pretty jealous. I what don't you know, did. I how, do they, like, how does the nonprofit world look at you? They look at you as some maverick who came in here and just know. dunked on them? We don't spend that much time uh, hanging out with nonprofits typically. I mean, our partners out in the field, sure. we, we have 44. Uh, partners out there across 27 countries that are helping people get clean water, but we're not really hanging out at those conferences. I mean, we're hanging out more with, uh, I'm learning and I'm getting ideas from startups, from people yeah. who are building transparent, data-driven building. If you walk into Charity Water headquarters in New York, um, it's about 35,000 square feet. You'll see Samsung donated $50,000 of TVs where we have KPIs everywhere. So we have the churn rates on our subscription. We have international up. We have website traffic. We have social media being monitored. We have you know internal Slack channels celebrating employees that are doing remarkable things. We just today um, were named in Fast Company's top 50 most innovative companies, company workplaces. So we often get to be that one little nonprofit that gets in yeah. – with you know the I don't know the WeWorks or the you were you you had like a bit of a what do they call it you were going to quit at one point you had a bit of a nervous breakdown would you say or you just hit the wall yeah it was I mean it wasn't a nervous breakdown I you weren't like years. crawled up in a fetal position no, but no, you were I like I don't know I if I can out. keep doing this yeah out. it's just it's take exhausting. me to that moment so I'm you know even where to were this you day, when you felt I'm, it I'm doing uh, I'll do seventy five flights this year. You know? aye, aye, aye. Um, again, I'm flying coach to Africa. It's it's Brutal. you know I'm six one, like I'm forty four now. It's Bro, I'm five not eight, as, not I'm five eight and a half, and I am not a coach 20, anymore. Twenty two hours, you know. I mean, I am on the short flights, but uh, and and you know we don't we don't complain about it. That's just no. that's what we've all signed up for. Yeah. Um, I drive a Kia Sorento. I live in a two bedroom apartment in New York City that I rent yeah. with my wife and two kids. I mean, we yeah. we have a very really. I just want to give more. Yeah. So. Uh, well, this take me to this that goes moment back where to you, that moment yeah. where we had eight years of growth. We took the organization from zero to $40 million, $43 million raised in year eight. And then in year nine, we shrank. We went into the 30s. And it was some market conditions. We had a, a big corporate donor pull out when they laid out 10,000 employees that actually came back the following year. Wow. So they really said it was us, not you. Um, we had another donor who had only given appreciated stock for seven years in a row, stock was down 40%, he paused. Uh -huh. And I just couldn't repeat the previous year. And going, I can't tell you, Jason, how hard it was to go from getting a million human beings clean water in year eight to 820,000 in year nine. I personally felt like I had let down 180,000 people. And, you know, it's nine Staples Centers, it's nine Madison, like I could see the people because I hadn't been smart enough. I hadn't raised the money. I, you know, you're supposed to you're not only do yeah. what you did the last year, like it's about growth. And in our case, my salary doesn't change as I grow this thing. People get clean water. So it's even, I was even harder you on myself. How, you realize how sick and demented that is. Like you're literally doing more than anybody. And then you're beating yourself up about getting 85% of the way there. Um, but, like that's but a I disease. Think that's, I don't think so. I think that's healthy because 
I had, so the learning was I wound up not quitting. Um, I, I read about this in the book and I remember calling my board and saying, hey, I think it's time to bring on a professional yeah. CEO. I'll stick around, oh, yeah. you know, I'll still fundraise and work on innovation, but you know, let's get a real leader to get this to the next level. And I remember a telling- A real leader, yeah. I mean, look, you know, when you don't grow, you all I know is growth, helping more and more and more and more people. And then suddenly 180,000 people less helped yeah. in a second year. So I thought it was my fault. Yeah. And and by the way, it is my, like it was my fault. I had not built no, it was a market sustainable conditions. Like you have, you take a bad beat once in a while. Like you're like a poker player loses one hand and then stares at the ceiling all well, night. Anyway, Sometimes that, you're going to get unlucky. That led to the realization that we had simply gotten too big to yeah. start at zero every year. So yeah. January one, the darkest day of every year, we would say, "Wow, we raised forty three million dollars. We helped a million humans get clean water." Now we got to do it again and grow. Oh, so exhausting. But the ticker goes down to zero. Yeah. So that led, that down year, just like the lawsuit led to us building a sophisticated water team yeah. now with 20 some people who are out there making sure we know about fluoride, monitoring water quality, sustainability, monitoring yeah. sustainability. Uh, our wells are now connected to the internet. We have a whole internet of things uh, happening right now. We have the largest data set in the history of the world when it comes to rural water supply. Thanks to a $5 million Google grant and, uh, wells that are basically imagine your and I want to look after this because yeah. one of your three wells may be connected to the cloud wow. and we can log onto our website and see how much water flowed yesterday that'd be and you did this 10 years ago yeah if it has wow. a sensor on it so crazy I just lost my train of thought but we no, no I was just talking about we, that moment where we, you almost crashed personally and like I, I told my, tell the board the board's supportive I go to my exec team and what I remember from this was they basically said stop whining and get back yeah. to work basically Right. I mean, you know, okay, we don't have, everything doesn't go up and to the right. And it was a real learning. I mean, again, I I hope that by just being vulnerable in the book, yeah. maybe it's helpful for other people. You know, these feel like basic lessons, but I called my dad and he's like, son, not everything goes up and to the right forever. Yeah. Did you stay true to your values? Did you compromise? I'm like, stay true to the values. We didn't compromise our integrity. Yeah, and by the way, it was our beats. best year by a bunch of other KPIs, just not the top line fundraising. Yeah. We had moved sustainability forward. We had high Hired well. We yeah. built the team. So you never brought in the professional CEO? I never brought in the professional CEO. So the next year, the I built the subscription program, started right. building the spring, saying, let's not start. Daniel Eck doesn't start zero every year in Spotify. Netflix no. doesn't start at zero. HBO no. doesn't start. They get to build mm. on a consumer base that they are delivering high quality product to, yeah. right? Every single month. So let's see if we can do that. And we built the spring. It started very small, 100 members, 200 members, uh, started and spreading around the world. And you can go to charitywater.com or Charitywater.org slash the spring. So everybody's got to do that right now. Charitywater.org slash the spring. That's I'm a super, member. My wife's like a member. Thirty bucks we, a month. I mean, it's not a lot of people out there that could do that. They could do that, knowing that 100 percent of the money goes. It's tax deductible, so it's easy breezy. So that's that's how we came out of it. Then we doubled the org in the next two years. Amazing. So we went from 35 to 50 to 70. Um, so sometimes you just have to stick with it. Yeah. And, and now I think if we did have another year where we can't, you know, it's funny. I remember like, I'm so naive at some of this. I remember Googling business S curves and like, this is what it yeah, looks like, right. right? You, you innovate, you get from here to there yeah. and then that starts tailing off and then yeah. you have to re-innovate. Sure. So what gets you here will not get you there. So at the moment, you know, we're trying to get the next 25 million people clean water. We're at 10 million. We're, we're at 9.9 .9 million. So we're about to cross 10 million served. I want to help the next 25 million people get clean water by 2025. So about a 4X are you acceleration. Are studying that or relying on other people to study it? In other words, are, are you doing innovative things or do you think it's just keep doing what you're doing? Like, Because it would seem to people in the tech business, like, how do you pick the next ways to go? How do you pick the next technologies? Yeah. So again, which giving, goes back to overhead. Giving and eighty two percent of rural yeah. people clean water yeah. is, you know, if you ask me, hey, I want to do another well today, we're gonna look at a country and we're gonna go find a rural village that doesn't have clean water and you're gonna help you that community that to get clean water. You work with we have the local a team. We, wow. have, uh, we have 20 some people who fly around the world. That's their full time job. Wow. Uh, vetting the partners, the countries. Uh, we look for stable operating environments. We're not in Yemen, for example. We're not in South Sudan. Uh, there's a whole uh, matrix of uh, decision matrix on where we think we can get the most bang for buck for dollars in the most sustainable way and right. impact the most amount of lives. So that, again, 12 years ago, that team didn't exist. Now it's a, it's a, 
It's a sophisticated team with lots of experience. They, I think they fly to the moon and back once or twice every year in their collective travels, you know, boots on the ground. You talk a lot in the book, I think, about how you were searching for meaning in your life. Maybe felt a little guilty about, you know, being a a scumbag. Well, or like a lost decade, like being like a club. I mean, I don't, you don't have to be that self-deprecating. You were like uh, hanging out in clubs like young people are apt to do in their 20s. But then you kind of, but you you got a little narcissistic and kind of ahead of yourself, maybe a little. Yeah. Like getting the guy, getting the You're bungalow. You're being kind. It was Getting pretty, the bungalow eight guy f- fired was pretty. Yeah. I mean, was I, pretty was, dark. I was a, I had, by the end of this 10 year 40 club run, I had turned into this. Uh, I rage like there was a rage there was a self-hatred a self-loathing mm. I had a cocaine problem an ecstasy problem a two pack of marble reds a day problem gambling pornography strip clubs like I picked up every vice slowly yeah you know, it was really like the proverbial frog in the pot you know yeah. I remember you know when I moved to New York City at 18 I was a virgin I wasn't I'd never drank before yeah I had never smoked before I mean, I was this good Christian kid that yeah. had taken care 14 of an invalid weeks later. mom. <laughs> but it all started slow. It was like, yeah. oh, let me just smoke some cigarettes yeah. to act, right? right? Oh, I'm going to do this play off Broadway. My character smokes, right? Yeah. So now, you know, two pack a day smoking habit. Yeah. Oh, well, I should start drinking a little bit. Yeah. Oh, well, everybody else is like, you know, getting laid. Well, let me yeah. start, you know, one by one, all of these vices, and then they just stuck and they wouldn't let go. And 10 years later, I'd come so far from the spirituality, the morality that I'd been brought up with that I hated my life. Your parents are Christians, like Uh hardcore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, I had, I think the religion, the rules had just been so oppressive for me. It was yeah. like, let me go and explore the opposite. There's a story, you know, in the Bible of the prodigal son who sure. basically flips the bird to his dad, says, cool for you, Yeah, I'm gonna go and do my thing, give me the money. Yeah, And he gets his inheritance and years later he squanders it all and he winds up in a you know, proverbial pig pen in that yeah. story. It's an actual pig pen. Yeah. And he said, I want to come home. Yeah. Like I miss the family. I miss the love. I miss the morality. So for me, it was a sense of wanting to come home. Um, I found that uh, really through this mission of helping others. And, and you know, I never, I, I, I quit everything in one moment. You know, I never smoked again. I never touched Coke or any of that stuff again. I haven't looked at a pornographic image in 15 years. Like wow. haven't, Ga- like I just, I walked away from all of it. How did you get it? away from the gambling? Asking for a friend. Um, I'm joking. It's, you know, it's funny because I speak in Vegas a lot. I'll yeah. probably speak in- Were you a uh, blackjack guy? You're a blackjack guy. I was blackjack. I was poker. I was craps. I mean- I see I, you got p- to a primarily point, bro, as a, po- as a blackjack a, guy. It got to a point where I would bet on, you know, women's soccer in Bulgaria, you know, and really? log on to some horrible online, you know, sports thing. I mean, it was just, it was Crazy. bad. Um, for me, it was, it, it was all or nothing. Like I just, I had to turn the yeah. switch off. It's funny. I was at a conference recently, a tech conference, and I was sitting behind a friend who was playing badly at blackjack, right? Way too yeah. much. And I was like, at least telling him how to play, you yeah. know, sitting like, oh, this is just too close. Yeah. You know, yeah. but I, but I think, you know, I was able to walk away from all of that, you know, 15 years ago. I never missed it. I mean, I've been blessed with an amazing wife and two beautiful children and, uh, I get to I get to raise money for people around the world in 27 countries to get clean water. Like it's an amazing blessing. I never. What's the motivation now? Because I can understand your motivation to let loose. Yeah, I understand how that can just. I've seen many people go down that road and take it too far, and I can really understand that. Hey, I got to cut this all off because I'm going to crash and burn. I want to be the prodigal son who goes home. But what is the motivation 12 years in now? Because you are must be exhausted, and this is a lot of pressure. How do you get up every day in year 12? Is it year 12 now? Year 13. How do you get up every day and be more motivated, or are you more motivated now than ever? And how do you keep that motivation up? Because what are you now? You're 40 something? 44. 44, I'm 48. How do you look at the next 40 years? Because you got at least 20, 30 good years in you, knock yeah. on wood. H- how do you look at motivation as a 44-year-old? Is it the legacy for your kids? Yeah, it's it's a, it's a great question. And I've been thinking about that more intentionally now um, Me too. than ever before. It's the kids you know, that have really, what kind of dad do I want to be? What 
uh, my dad, my, my five-year-old, uh, or he's almost five, just asked me the other day, he said, how old do I have to be before I can work with you at Charity Water? Wow. Well, that gets you. And, you know, he's, I mean, boy, you know, I didn't actually know the answer. Uh, the answer is today. <laughs> yeah, You today. come with me to the office well, he's today. Well, I'm going to take him to Africa next year um, at that's, five That's and what a you half. do with these kids. you got to so, give them the So, a couple of things. Here's, here's one thing. And a lot of the people um, listening can maybe identify with this. It feels like I have done a fraction of what I thought I would have done by now. Okay, You so, feel you've done a fraction. Yeah, with in the, 400 million in the raised. one in the one tenth to one fiftieth land. So okay. by now, I believed I would have raised billions and billions of dollars yeah. for the most agreed upon cause in the world, clean water, with this model, one hundred percent. Okay, so in let fairness, me just, you were hopped up on coke, and it was five a.m. when you thought that. No, but no, but here's what makes it you hard. Here's what makes it that. hard. Okay, yeah. so in my 136 families, yeah. there are tons of very successful yeah. entrepreneurs, billionaires, yeah. that are younger than me. So recently, I was sitting with one of our very generous donors in Seattle, and he'd started a gaming company. Um, I think he'd maybe run it for five or six years, and he sold it for 750 million dollars. That's Boom. twice as much money. Money. Now we could argue value, right? Sure. But in a dollar amount. Right, I've raised four hundred million dollars yeah. in twelve and a half years of work, inviting people to be generous, and in half the time, he created double the value. So that to me actually fires me up a little bit. Like I hope the best is yet to come. It is actually, and yeah. I there's a very clear number in my mind. I want to personally help a hundred million people. Wow. I want to help move a hundred million people from dirty water to clean water and and have that at least be the mark that I make. And I'm at 10% of that. So it feels like it's not time to quit. So you, the setting of goals is a big part of this for you. Like you have to come up yeah. with new goals. Yeah. I do that too. So I know I'm trying to raise a billion dollars to get the next 25 million people clean water. Well, and that's if easy. I, if Where's I get Bezos that? and all this? Have you met Jeff? I haven't. You know, it's funny. Well, Je hold on Jeff, a second. Uh, this on. is super easy. Mackenzie or Jeff Bezos. <laughs> hold on. There's like literally a thousand people watching the program right now who know them. Can somebody email this moment to Jeff and Mackenzie Bezos? Mackenzie? Mackenzie. Mackenzie Bezos. Right now, you're the richest guy on the planet. You're the richest woman on the planet. It's a billion dollars. Just give it to him 50 million a year over the next 20 years in an endowment. And then we're done. Do it right now, Jeff McKenzie. There's a do funny it right story. now. So Jeff it's, actually tweeted. It's an tweeted, easy thing for him to do. He tweeted how do you, a couple years ago. How do you make ago. more money? How do I give away money? Yes, and you know what the you know what the answer was? You know what number one was? The yeah. AI ran the answers. Yeah, clean water. Of course, Jeff. Number one answer to that. It was fascinating. I think you could find this on Fast Company. So he tweets, hey, I'm embarking on a philanthropic yeah. uh, journey. I'm looking about pressing needs now and causes now. Right. Tell me what you think. AI crawls all the answers. Clean water number of one. Of course. Hold on. So this is, this is this good is at least. This is a no-brainer for him because he's spending billions on Blue Origin to get people to another planet yeah. because well, he's so, fearful so this, of this planet's So to answer destiny. your question, this is why I feel like the best is yet to come. And of this course. is why I feel like I've done so little because there's so much wealth. There's so much money being spent. I know 30-year-olds worth $1.6 billion. Of course. You know, you do too. Yeah. And I've raised 400 million from a million people in 12 and a half years. So it doesn't yeah. feel, it feels unfinished. It feels like yeah. now is the time to hopefully build on the track record, the hard work. Yeah. I've been on, you know, 1,500 flights. I've been to 69 countries. I've made a thousand speeches. Like, you know, I built a great, great, well, smart team who is working their butts off. Is like, there, you know, like. So I if think we were, showing up, like I keep showing up. I got to keep showing up and hopefully great things is, will happen. That is the secret. Showing up is what makes you successful at this. And continuing to go to work because all it takes, like that million dollar from- uh, Mr. Birch, yeah, uh, Yeah, that those random acts will just keep happening, right? Even at a tragedy with Rachel's death, the nine-year-old tragically died, resulted in millions of dollars. There's somebody who's listening right now who's got 10 or 20 or 100 billion, and you actually have the credibility to deploy that now, where if you just looked eight, nine, 10 years ago, you would say, if you gave me a billion dollars, you wouldn't be ready for it. You, your ego might have been ready for it, right? Yeah. But you wouldn't have I'm been really... ready to deploy. You could deploy 50 million a year right now. No problem. More, more, more. You could yeah. credibly deploy that. Yeah. Yeah, and absolutely. not have like some crazy amount of oh, waste. Oh yeah, we can get 60 plus out this year, 100 next year. We're, 
We yeah. built that team. It took us took us 13 years. Like yeah. if you'd asked me eight years ago, were we great at high quality water in a sustainable way? Mm-hmm. Building it, getting there. Now yeah. we have. You know, I think the other thing that helps me stay in the game is I'm really not driven by money. So I've turned down C-level job offers at unicorns. Like I just, I want to give more money away. I, I you know had you should... 10 years chasing money, the watch, the cars, the... It doesn't bring happiness. It doesn't bring happiness. It's not purpose. It's not legacy. There is a moment where all that fear of not having money goes away. And you hit that at a certain point. Like 70K is, I think, what the study showed. (laughs) Not in in New York City. Not in New York City or in... (laughs) Uh, or San Francisco, San Fran, right? But they did say when you hit, get past seven, you stop worrying about the rent and the food in yeah. America. Pick whatever number that is in the major cities. So you're past that. But yeah, it literally does not matter. Well, as I explain it to people, because we run in the same circles, it's like, do you think when we go get that high ho cheeseburger or whatever great cheeseburger you love, it tastes any different based on net worth? does not. It doesn't. And do you think laughing and sharing a bottle of wine with your friends on the beach or on the Champs de Lisée or wherever you are with a baguette and a brie, it's the best moment in your life. Yeah. And it is, cost you 60 bucks. Yeah. The cheeseburger tastes the same for a billionaire, for Mark Cuban, Elon Musk, Mark Zuckerberg, or the two of us, or two people who just walked in, you know, who are delivering burgers for Uber Eats. It's the same taste. Yep. So just- like take that in, right? It is. And I feel like I have to be more generous than anyone I'm asking to give. Like I have to keep eating my own dog food. Yeah. You know, I need to keep, uh, that's why even with the book, you know, it was a huge advance and um, it would have been enough to put both of my kids through college and I gave it Bruh. all away. Bruh. I wanted to give it, I, but I, it needs to be pure, you know? All right. It needs to be pure and and I- I, I, people, I got the solution. I got the solution. You, ever, you know what a venture partner is? Have you heard of this term, I, the venture? I, do. I know. What is a venture partner? It's someone who kind of consults a VC firm and, okay. and helps them vet ideas, coach founders. Even simpler. You just introduce somebody. You know everybody. You run in all the great circles. You meet founders all the time. Yeah. So you're meeting all these young founders, right? For the pool. So you get the equity in there. There'll be one of these a year. <laughs> <It's> a <chase>. <laughs> no, I think that you need to take down a win for your family. Right, and Listen, for those founders who are giving the focus you. is great. My family is great. Anyway, my family's you fine. Are, we, one I, of these VC firms would love to have you on their webpage as a venture partner, and then all you do is a venture partner. Nobody's going to think anything less of you for doing this. You earn this chip; it's no problem. You just say, "Met this founder at one of our galas. She's amazing." Met this founder. At Starbucks. So you're making me so uncomfortable. That I know that, but We're I want you mission. to understand. We're no, off mission, no, 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 no. <laughs> There's also the mission of you getting paid for all this hard work, and I'm, I'm honestly, I'm doing and fine. Put your the kids more money, like I'm just going to give it away. Here's I'm just going to give it away. That which is fine. I which is your right to do it. My greatest ambition around money yeah. is writing a million dollar check to right. a charity so here's in how the you same do stage that Michael did it for me. You get one of these venture partner deals. Super easy. There's 20 people who would including me, who would love to have you on our website as a feeder. Then when you meet great founders, you don't, you just say, wow, that's an interesting idea. Let me send you over to you know, whoever it is at Sequoia, Benchmark, Launch, whatever firm it is. And you say, I met this person. They're interesting. I like the idea. would love to be involved with them. Boom. That person puts the 1% into the pool. Great. And then you have upside on the deal. And it would be great for you because you have, see, the thing is, you don't understand. Your entrepreneurial mind is so sharp. And I... Like networking and marketing is my thing. And I read your book and I'm like taking notes and like, wow, this guy understands marketing and events and networks and money. Like most people can't understand one of those things, but you understand the network, media, and money. Each of those is leverage in a different way. Very few people can put those together. Yeah, I'm just very uncomfortable about using any of these gifts for myself. I did that for 10 years and I really want to no, no. parlay them into- uh, Using them to get people to, to pop bottles at a club is down here. Using them to save the planet and help people get clean water is way up here. And then somewhere in the middle is just taking care of your family and being properly compensated for the skills you bring to the table. And you deserve that. You're very kind. <laughs> no, but I mean, a startup with your marketing ability, like your mind is sharp on it. Like this birthday idea, it's kind of how I met when I had Alex from com.com on the podcast. Yeah, yeah. I'm seeing him tomorrow. Yeah. Oh, okay, great. So, you know. He's a well member. And, he's a well member. Yeah. And yeah, Alex, 
actually, and, uh, and his Birch me was an investor, and yeah, and, and I Alex were the, has or, taught us uh, about the subscription business as well. Exactly. Learned a lot from him. So we were the first investors in that company, along with uh, Michael Birch and Sochi. Sochi is that pronounced yeah. name? Sochi. Um, we were the initial investors in Com, and it's super fascinating because he created that million dollar homepage and like I know, I remember. little things like that. You have that same gift, like the birthday thing was so clever on a product design basis. And these other, I'm the flattered. spring I'm and the flattered. pool, these kind of products that you design, like you have that product genius in you and combine with your ability to do media and finance, woo, you would be like, legendary in the venture space. Let me get my 100 million people. Exactly. Let me get my 100 million All people, right. Jason. <laughs> On that note, I'm going to tell everybody who's listening right now, stop the nonsense, charitywater.org slash the spring. You can afford that. And then if you got a startup, charitywater.org slash the pool. You can afford that. Go put a well in. We didn't curse this episode. You got to listen to the book. The book is fantastic. Thanks, man. I really appreciate you I taking really the time. I really think it's great. I can't believe that you didn't take the goddamn well, It goes to Charity event. Water. So even by uh, supporting the book, people get to support Charity right. Water. Well, listen, continued success. 38,000 water projects, clean water to 10 million people, 400 million raised from a million donors, 40,000 spring members in 100 countries. That is the big win right there. Oh, sustainability. $14 million in annual reoccurring revenue and growing. Um, yeah. And you didn't give me that table, uh, Lotus. I tried to get in and you wouldn't get me that table. You don't think I, you think I forgot. No, I wasn't at Lotus. I was always at Bungalow 8. I lived around the Bungalow, corner. So yeah. I was friends with Amy Saka. Yeah. So when I heard these stories, yeah. I was like, oh, I used to live at Bungalow 8 yeah. on oh my gosh. Sunday and Monday nights. That takes me back. Every once in a while, someone will mention a club in New York that I completely forgot about, and then all the memories flood. Well, it was right? one of the it great. It was so short lived. I mean, these well, were no, six months. You were there right at the mm. at the end of the Peter Gation peak. Right, and I worked for Peter. At you Lime, worked for Peter at Limelight. I did at Limelight and Tunnel. Oh, briefly, really? Briefly. I lived around the corner from Tunnel in the Starrett Lehigh Building on Twenty Sixth mm -hmm. and the West Side Highway, mm -hmm. and looking down was the Tunnel, which when the tunnel was hopping, that's where hip hop kind of started. People don't remember, Sunday nights was like the big hip hop night yep. there. And then I don't know, it was Tuesdays at Limelight. Anyway, Limelight is now a pizzeria and a mall. Yep. I don't know if you know that. So you yep. worked for Peter Gation during the club kick games? And now, yeah, so my first wow. night out was Club USA. There was Buda of Bar was hopping on Varick and Van Dam. And yep. then I was like a sub sub Club USA was in the, in the basement was in of Times Square. Times Square, right? Right. And then I worked at Nell's. Remember you that worked place at Nell's, of course. Street? Yes, I remember Nell's, of course. So, yeah. And there was Live Bay was now. on 14th Street. All these that was a cool bar. It's funny. My wife and I went out. Cafe Society, Cafe Iguana. Yeah. Cafe Roxy, Iguana. Yep. Mars. Yeah. Twilo. Twilo. Yeah, all of them. Halo. Halo. Uh, Lots my, of them. My wife robots. You ever go to Robots? Save the Robots, of yeah, course. See, we used to call it the Robots. But that yeah. was in the Lower East Side. 4 a.m. it would open. Yeah. People don't realize how like late this stuff went. We would go to robots. Last night I checked into a hotel at eleven oh five. Everything was closed. Here. New York, we would go out Everything at eleven thirty. We go I to dinner. Get a burger last night. Two o'clock we'd be, <laughs> yeah, going to bungalow. And then four AM. Well, back in the day, we'd go to robots and we'd see Chemical Brothers or Orb yeah. or Orbital. Like New York was so yeah. awesome in that period. It was. I remember going to CBGB's back in the day. Yeah. So many cool bands. CBGB's awesome. hey, fun, all right, fun hanging. Thanks uh, for your support. Everybody man. get the book and donate. We'll see you all next time on this week's Startups. Bye-bye.